Okay, uh, we can get started. We have a lot to cover today, and uh, I just want to make an announcement about the, the exams. At the end of the class today, you can pick up your exam. They're in piles based on the first number of your student number, so 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. So line up and pick them up, sort through there, uh, pick up your exam. I'm not handing back the Scantrons. If you want to look at your Scantron, you'll have to come to my office and do that. Uh, you should have received your grade by now. The performance was actually very good on the midterm. The median, which is how we did, do the grading here, was 82.5, which was higher than it's been in my memory. The mean uh, was 78 and a half, which is about where it usually is. So a lot of people did really well. A few people did really badly, bringing down the mean. Um, but Professor Walsh and I, take into account the overall performance of the, the class, if everyone does well, we don't have to give a certain amount of C's and B minuses. So uh, don't worry about um, trying to you know, make your friend fail in this class so you can do better. Uh, we will keep, if everybody continues to learn and do well and answer the questions, then you'll all, um, we'll do, you know, we can adjust the curve later on. So we need to accomplish two things today. We need to talk about antigen processing and presentation for class one and class two. And we need to talk about MHC genetics and polymorphism. And the second part, I'm going to spend most on that. It is probably the most conceptually difficult part of this entire course. So, and it's important that you understand it before you move on to T cell development and then later T cell activation. I'm going to kind of move quickly through the first part of this lecture. It's a bit of the typical number of the parts, talk about the process. It's not conceptually difficult. It's a little bit of memorization. And I have a couple of videos that summarize these first, these class one and class two processing. If I have time, I'll show them at the end. But what I really want to do is kind of get through this part in about 15 minutes and then move on to, to take our time as we talk about the more complicated concepts later on. Okay. Oh, the last thing about the exam is I'll, I'll send around an email with instructions for regrade requests uh, later today. Now, um, proteins from viruses and from your, from your own uh, cell are made in the cytoplasm. Some are made in ribosomes in the cytoplasm. Those that are destined to be secreted or transmembrane are made in ribosomes uh, just joining the endoplasmic reticulum. And MHC molecules are an example of that. So I just pasted in this MHC molecule here. And the part that binds peptide is facing into the ER lumen. So how does it get access to peptides from proteins in the cytoplasm? The way that happens is a two-step process that's illustrated in this figure 517. The first thing is that all proteins in the cell have a certain turnover rate of being, after they're made, they get degraded uh, when they get old or when they're misfolded or somehow damaged. And that's true of all your host proteins as well as any viral or other pathogen proteins that might be in the cytoplasm. And the main mechanism for degrading proteins is known as the proteasome. This is a highly conserved structure that's found even in archibacteria with a very similar composition of proteins. And there are 28 subunits. You don't need to know their names or even the number. It's just like it's a huge molecular machine for degrading proteins. And what happens is that proteins come in one end, get unfolded and digested, and come out the other end as peptides. One thing I do want you to know about the proteasome is that the comp composition of the subunits changes in cells that are infected or that are responding to interferons uh, during viral infection so that the proteasome becomes even better at producing peptides that are able to bind to MHC molecules. So in all cells, you have a proteasome that's degrading proteins and peptides, generally making small peptides, two or three amino acids. But during viral infection, the proteasome changes so it's very efficient at making those eight to 10 amino acid peptides that are good for binding MHC class one. So that, that's the first step. The second step is you have to get these hydrophilic peptides across the <clears throat> membrane into the ER lumen. And that occurs through a, a process, a process uh, uh, a structure known as TAP, the transporters associated with antigen processing. And it's actually a dimer of two proteins, TAP1 and TAP2. Uh, and if you have a mutation in either gene for TAP1 or TAP2, which has been found in certain cell lines, I don't know if it's found in any human beings, but 
certain cell lines, uh, then they cannot transfer peptides from the cytoplasm to the endoplasmic reticulum, and they have severe defects in, in presenting peptides with MHC class 1. So degradation and then transport through TAP1, TAP2 heterodimer. Now you have peptides in the in ER, but it's not quite so simple that they just bind to MHC. What's the next step? Shown in the next figure. First I want to define a general class of proteins known as chaperones. You may have heard of them in other classes. It's not necessarily like a chaperone that takes you to the dance. In this case, it's a chaperone that makes sure that you get folded properly and not aggregated and degraded. A lot of proteins, when they're first synthesized, have patches of hydrophobic areas. They could aggregate. They could uh, have, have problems. And so chaperones kind of keep the proteins ready and folded as they wait to encounter the other proteins to make the final complex. Okay, so in the first step, the class one heavy chain, remember alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and transmembrane, is synthesized and inserted into the ER, and it's stabilized by a chaperone known as calnexin. Calnexin actually is a very important chaperone in various aspects of immunology. It, it's involved in MHC class two chaperone uh, function, and also for heavy chains, of the antibody and for the T cell receptor alpha and beta chains. But we'll just talk about it as a, as a chaperone that stabilizes the newly formed class one alpha chain. That gives it time to wait for beta two microglobulin, which is the other part of class one molecules, to come in and interact with the class one alpha chain. At that point, calnexin is released. Yeah. Sorry, I just left something here. Oh yeah, go ahead. And a bunch of other proteins join the, the complex. Uh, and in the video that I'll upload on the website, you'll name a lot of these. But the one I, I, the one I want you to know for this class is called Tapasin, T-A-P-A-S-I-N. And it serves as a bridge between the TAP transporters and the MHC class one molecule. And it basically means that peptides that come out of the TAP tran transporter are very close, in very close proximity to empty MHC class one molecules. So that's shown here. The proteasome is generating these peptide fragments. They're being transported by the TAP transporter. And there's going to be thousands of these peptides coming into the ER at all times in all of your nucleated cells uh, in your body that are making proteins. Um, a small fraction of them will have affinity for the MHC class 1 molecules there. The rest will kind of bounce off. And you'll see that in the animation. Only when you have a really tight binding peptide does the process get completed. So if a peptide binds tightly into the groove of the MHC class 1 molecule, the folding is completed. It becomes tightly uh, bound to, to beta 2 microglobulin. It releases these other protein components, and it is exported through the secretory pathway to the Golgi and eventually to the plasma membrane. Now it's not surprising that viruses have evolved mechanisms to try to avoid presentation of their peptides uh, because that will lead to MHC class 1 recognition by CTLs and killing of the cell. And many viruses in their genomes encode proteins that interfere with various aspects of this process. They might uh, clog up the TAP transporter or they might interfere with chaperone function. But overall, that leads to a failure of those cells infected with that virus to deliver peptides efficiently to MHC class 1. And then what happens in those cells is class 1 molecules stay in the ER. They can't be transported to the surface. And even if they did, they wouldn't be presenting peptides. So that's an, a, a really useful mechanism viruses have to try to escape from uh, detection by CD8 T cells. But evolution is smarter than that. And our own bodies, our own uh, uh, systems have evolved a way to overcome this viral defense mechanism. And that is the natural killer cell, the NK cell. Remember back to NK cells, I talked about inhibitory signals. Well, the most, probably the most important inhibitory signal that an NK cell receives all the time is from MHC class 1 molecules on the surface. Anytime an NK cell bumps into a cell, it, if it has an MHC class 1 molecule, regardless of peptides bound, it sends a negative signal to the NK cell to leave it alone. But in the absence of that negative signal, if class 1 molecules are not on the surface, that's a bad sign. That means it might be virally infected. 
And then in case it will kill a cell that does not have MHC class 1. So the first mechanism we use to, uh, to kill, the, the adaptive immune system used to kill virally infected cells is viral peptides presented on the surface with class 1. If the virus happens to block that process, now the NK cells can recognize that it's probably virally infected and will kill that cell. Okay, questions? Now we can talk about class 2 peptide processing. Let's just start with this figure 520 and just remind you, it basically shows you what we just talked about with class 1, the proteasome, peptides binding to class 1 molecules, and then getting to the surface. Well, for class 2, remember the purpose of MHC class 2 is to present peptides from pathogens that are either outside the cell or that have, are taken up, have taken up residence in endocytic vesicles. Certain kinds of bacteria, like mycobacteria, um, are perfectly happy living in endocytic vesicles and they actually have ways of blocking transport and fusion with the lysosome uh, so that they don't get degraded. But proteins from these pathogens or from extracellular antigens eventually do get uh, released and broken apart in the endosomes by the, in the low pH and the, the proteases that exist there. And some will make it to the phagolysosome. And so in any cell, like a macrophage or a dendritic cell or a B cell that's taken up something foreign, you will have peptides produced from those in these vesicles. And they, they will bind to MHC class 2 molecules here. And then those MHC class 2 molecules bound to peptide will go back to the surface and present to CD4 positive helper T cells. So there's a problem here, which is that you make your MHC class 2 molecule, just like the MHC class 1, uh, insert it into the ER, but you do not want it to bind peptides until it gets out here to meet up with the endocytic vesicles that have peptides from the outside of the cell. How is that problem solved? Well, in the ER, there's a protein known as the invariant chain. And the reason it has that name is because it is the same in all individuals. And as we'll see in a few moments, class 2 molecules are different. They're polymorphic. <laughs> invariant chain is not. And the function, the invariant chain has two functions. One is that a piece of the invariant chain binds very tightly into the peptide binding groove of MHC class 2 molecules in the ER and prevents any peptides that are in the ER from binding there. So it basically just clogs up the MHC class 2 molecule uh, so that noth nothing else can bind there. Um, and the other thing that the, the invariant chain uh, does is it, it serves as a chaperone. In this case, the definition of, of bringing somebody to a dance or bringing a protein to another place, it chaperones the class 2 molecule to that compartment where it can bind peptides. Now, in the original version of the notes that I, I posted that you may have printed out or may be looking at on your computers, there was a whole section of the notes that, for some reason, I got lost from last year. Uh, so I'm going to refer to those notes now. The missing text is here. I'll go back and forth. But I posted a new version of the notes that you can download either now or later on. In fact, there was a, a, two versions. Use version 3 because I found another mistake later on. OK. So the invariant chain is produced here in the ER. It binds to MHC class 2. And that leads to the, its transit towards the endosome compartments. During that process, pieces of the invariant chain are cleaved off by proteases. But there's a, a piece of it that still remains attached. It's known as the clip peptide. And it, that stays bound in the peptide binding groove. So a series of peptide cleavages by proteases known as cathepsins leaves the clip peptide. And that's what it stands for, class 2 associated invariant chain peptide. You can just call it clip, bound to the peptide binding groove of class 2. Now that vesicle with MHC class 2 and CLIP fuses with the vesicle containing the peptides generated by acidic proteases. Oops, wrong way. And here we are. So you have MHC class 2 with the CLIP peptide and these peptides, uh, these external peptides here. And now there's another molecule 
in this vesicle that's known as HLA-DM, which catalyzes the release of the clip peptide and allows the MHC class 2 molecule to sample the other peptides. And if one binds tightly, the MHC class 2 molecule will actually be able to go to the surface. So clip is released, catalyzed by HLA-DM. Peptides are loaded onto MHC class 2 in this late endosomal compartment. Now the name of this compartment is called the MHC class 2 compartment or M2C. This is the compartment where the MHC class 2 with the clip peptide joins up with the other peptides and where HLA-DM catalyzes release of clip and allows other peptides to bind. Right. Correct. Now, like I said, I have animations that are very useful here. I hope I'll have time at the end to come back to them, but go ahead. Uh, so HLA-DM is a beta surface protein of the cell? HLA-DM is not on the surface. It's, it's just, it hangs out in these vesicles. It's somehow targeted there and stays there. And um, oddly enough, its structure is quite similar to class II molecules. It seems to be um, some kind of close relative and we'll see that in the in later slides. Uh, but the important thing to remember is it's a protein that's resident in this compartment and its job is to kind of shake up the, the real class II molecule to let it release the clip peptide and allow other peptides to bind. This never goes to the surface, it just stays there. The, the Nobel Prize this year for physiology and medicine was all about how cargo moves around in cells. They have sequences that direct them to different places, the ER, the Golgi, the surface, the lysosome. In this case, the M2C compartment is uh, where HLA-DM is targeted to and it just stays there. I don't know what that sequence is, but yeah. Um, what's the point of once it's inside the vesicle, why do you need that? You need that because there's still going to be peptides around that could bind during this transit process that might be from um, internal proteins that were you know, uh, made from degraded proteins in the ER. So you, you, want, you want it to stay bound until you get to this compartment that specifically is enriched in the, in the peptides from outside the cell. So there's two more points that I want to make on this slide. It, you find that in uninfected cells, there's always an excess of MHC class I molecules over peptides, um, and so there's always plenty of empty MHC cl class 1 proteins ready to bind peptides in the ER. So if you have a viral infection, there's no problem with competition. If there were an excess of peptides, the viral peptides would have to fight with other self-peptides to get onto the MHC. That's not the case. There's always an excess of MHC class 1 so that any host or viral peptide that has affinity will immediately bind and be displayed on the surface. That's also true for class 2. There's always more class II peptides, uh, class II molecules than there are peptides in these compartments so that if, there's, uh, if there is a peptide that can bind tightly, it has place to go. And the second thing is that only, uh, it's very important that these associations are stable. Once you get a binding event and class I or class II goes to the surface, you do not want that peptide to let go, that MHC to let go of the peptide. If, that, if you did let go, then the pathogen could escape detection, or the peptide could fall off one cell, land on MHC of another cell, and that could lead it to being destroyed even though it's not infected, or a T cell helping the wrong target cell. So there, if you actually look at the peptides that are bound to MHC class 1 or class 2, they have extremely high affinity for that peptide binding group. And we'll talk a bit more about how uh, that affinity is, uh, is generated in a few minutes. Okay, so now we are going to talk about MHC genetics. And first, I want to tell you what HLA means. All the MHC genes have the prefix HLA, and that stands for human leukocyte antigen. And the reason it got that prefix is to distinguish it from the red blood cell antigens that are the basis of the blood groups, the ABO blood groups. These are antigens found on white blood cells. And by antigens, I mean these are 
structures that could be detected by antibodies in people who are having transplants and so forth. So they're not foreign antigens in that sense of coming from a pathogen, but they're antigens that can be detected by antibodies uh, in individuals. Now there, we've talked about diversity in T cell receptors and B cell receptors that's generated by VDJ recombination, junctional diversity. There's also diversity in MHC class one and class two molecules, but it's generated by completely different mechanism that doesn't involve DNA recombination at all. It just involves uh, two different features. One is called gene families and one is polymorphism. So let's start with the gene families. Figure 524. You can see that there are a bunch of different proteins here for class one. There's actually six class one molecules shown here as proteins that are encoded by six different genes. But it, the three over here that have red alpha chains that you need to know for this class. These are called HLA-A, HLA-B, and HLA-C. Each individual in this room has three different genes that each encode a different class one alpha chain. So you have a family of class one genes. HLA-A, HLA-B, and HLA-C are the three genes in that family. And every nucleated cell in your body expresses class one, but not just one type of class one, three different gene products, each encoding an alpha chain that can pair with beta-2 microglobulin and form a peptide binding group. And you notice that they're red here. They're polymorphic. And we'll come back to what that means uh, in a minute. But what basically, for now, what it means is that your father and your mother probably had a different sequence for HLA-A and for HLA-B and HLA-C. And so that means that you really have six different MHC class I molecules on the surface of your cells because most people are heterozygous for each of these and have a different allele for HLA, A, B, and C. But first, the gene family. You have three different genes in this family. Each one can encode a different MHC class I molecule. Same general function, but the sequences are different enough that they'll present different peptides. Now for class II, there are five uh, proteins shown here, each a pair of alpha and beta chains. The three that are involved in presenting peptides to CD4 T cells are shown over here. They're called HLA-DP, HLA-DQ, and HLA-DR. And they're each actually formed by a pair of different proteins. So you have three pairs of genes for MHC class II. And all your professional antigen presenting cells, B cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells have not one but three different types of MHC class II molecule on the surface. And again, because most people are heterozygous for the different genes, you can have many more than those. You can have uh, as many as 12 different MHC class II molecules on the surface. Just briefly, these uh, proteins over here, as I said, they do look a little bit like MHC class I. Uh, and they do bind to beta-2 microglobulin, but they have other functions in cells that are, are not specifically related to killing by CD8 CTLs. And then there's some other class II-like molecules. We learned about one, HLA-DM, that functions inside the cell, but it's not involved in presenting peptides to uh, CD4 T cells. And we'll come back to this figure in a minute. I hope it'll make more sense after I talk about this slide, which is about genetic polymorphism. The definition of genetic polymorphism is variation at a single genetic locus and its product, or the protein that's produced, with, within a species. And each individual variant of that gene is called an allele. You should know this from Bio 97. And this figure just, it's just a table that shows all the different alleles in the population that have been found by DNA sequencing. And it's quite dramatic. So here are the six class one genes, the three that actually present peptides, there are hundreds of different alleles or allotypes as they call them in the population. And you can see that it's unlikely that any two individuals picked randomly are going to have the same allele for HLA-A or HLA-B or HLA-C. And that's why the two parents, the offspring that are produced, tend to have a different allele for each HLA-A and B and C. If you look at the class two molecules, DP, DQ, and DR. Um, the polymorphism isn't quite as high, but there's, 
somewhere between you know, 15 and, and 100 or even 400 for the beta uh, DR beta. There's some additional complexity here in DR beta. Let's just focus on DR beta 1. The exception is DR alpha chain. There's only two alleles that are known. But for everything else, it's pretty polymorphic. Now you go back to this figure and you can see what this means. Highly polymorphic means hundreds, hundreds of different alleles in the population. Polymorphic means you know, 10 to 100 or so. That's in green. Um, monomorphic means every individual has the same or maybe there's two alleles in the population. And I told you in the, in the previous lecture, beta-2 microglobulin is not polymorphic. We all have the same sequence of beta-2 microglobulin. And for the, the HLA-DR alpha chain, it's, there's only a couple of alleles. But the DR beta chain is very diverse. So gene families, three different class 1 molecules encoded by three different genes, three different class 2 pairs of class 2 uh, alpha beta chains encoded by different genes. Polymorphic morphism means there's a lot of different alleles in the population uh, for all of these with the exception of this alpha chain for HLA-DR. Any questions about that? Yeah. Does it affect on the affinity of binding? This is an important point. There are thousands of potential peptides that, that are present in the ER for class 1 or in the MHC class 2 loading compartment for class 2. Some of them will have high affinity, some will not. And if you have my allele of HLAA, I might bind this peptide but not that. Your allele might bind that other peptide but not this. We all based on the sequence of our MHC molecules, will bind strongly to different self-peptides and foreign peptides. And we'll come to that in a minute. Now, if you just sequence someone's DNA or, or tissue type them and find out the two alleles they have for A, HLA-A, the two for B and C, uh, you can list them all in a row, and that's called the haplotype. So I might be HLA-A3, B27, C36, on one chromosome, and A7, B1, C22 on the other. Those are called haplotypes. It's just the, the name of the allele and all the alleles for class 1, and then there's a class 2 haplotype as well. This is a term that may come up in an in a MCAT exam, and it's really important for transplantation medicine to establish the MHC haplotypes of the donor and the recipient. Well, this is all kind of abstract in two dimensions. Let's put it back into the three-dimensional structure of the MHC molecule, and hopefully it'll make more sense what we mean here. We talked about this figure already. It's just to remind you that the main structural aspects of all MHC class 1 and class 2 molecules are similar. Um, but here's the figure I want to talk about. Here, what they've done is they've diagrammed where the polymorphic residues are in MHC class 1 and class 2 molecules. And I, I don't like this figure. Um, well, let's just start with class 1. Remember, all beta-2 microglobulins are the same. And if you look at MHC class 1 alpha chains, whether it's HLA, A, B, or C, um, they're all very similar in the A3 region and most of the A1 and A2 domains as well. The differences in the amino acids are all found in the areas that contact peptides or that point out towards the T cell receptor. If you had a lot of different sequences in A3, that wouldn't be useful. It might interrupt your ability to have CD8 bind there. If you had a lot of different sequences in the structural regions of the beta sheet, that wouldn't really be helpful. It could disrupt the structure. But during evolution, as mutations have occurred in MHC class 1 and class 2 molecules, if they change the sequence of, of an amino acid that interacts with peptides or T cell receptor, that may increase or decrease the the fitness of that individual, or it may have no effect at all. But those mutations accumulate over time, and they distribute it in the population. So the reason MHC class 1 molecules are so polymorphic is because mutations that change their sequence, if they change their ability to bind peptides or T cell receptor, could have an advantage to the individual. They could present a peptide that, that uh, wasn't available before to the immune system. They could activate a T cell that wasn't activatable before. Now, for class 2, it's the same situation. And the reason I, I don't like this figure is because they show the DR alpha chain, which is, happens to be the one that is not polymorphic. But the other DP alpha and DQ alpha are very polymorphic. 
So you should really think of all class two molecules similar to class one as being polymorphic throughout the peptide binding groove. In, but again, it's in the residues that contact peptides or that point out towards the T cell receptor. Does that make sense? So again, if you have, if you have, and think of any gene in your body that does something, hemoglobin or actin or some other, some enzyme in the cell. If a, a person gets a new, new mutation in that gene, it's very unlikely to be helpful to the function. We've been around for you know, hundreds of thousands of years. Our proteins are very well adapted to doing the jobs they need to do. So new mutations tend to cause diseases. But they do occur, and they can you know, reduce fitness. But over the eons of evolution, when mutations occur in MHC genes, class one or class two, as long as they don't disrupt the structure of the MHC molecule or its ability to interact with CD8 or CD4, they're not going to cause the person to drop dead because they don't have an enzymatic function or they can't carry oxygen. All that's going to do is change the peptides that can bind to the MHC, class, uh, MHC molecule. And we'll see in a minute that it, there's a benefit to polymorphism both at the level of the individual and the level of the species. So overall, there's a selective advantage to us having polymorphism at the MHC. Now figure 530 goes into some details about what generates affinity for peptides. There are thousands of peptides available to these MHC molecules. What is it about these peptides that actually leads to binding? Now I told you for class 1 they have to be a certain length uh, and for both class 1 and class 2 that the backbone um, nitrogens and, and carbon atoms can, can hydrogen bond but also there are specific residues that can contact these, the floor and the sides of the MHC molecules. And for any particular MHC allele, so they're showing here one allele of HLAA known as 201. If you look at all the peptides you can find in bound to this allele of HLA uh, 201, here's an example from HIV, from an HIV infected patient. But if you look at all the peptides that bind, you'll find that all of them have either a leucine or methionine at position two, a valine at position six, and a valine or leucine at position nine. The other positions don't matter. These are called the anchor residues. And it's probably because the structure of that class one molecule and the way the peptide is arrayed, those residues make contacts with the MHC molecule in a way that produces tight binding. And the other residues that are shown here as open squares are pointing out towards the T cell receptor. So they don't affect the binding affinity to MHC at all. But there's always two or three positions in the peptide that are identical or very similar. Otherwise, they would not have affinity for that MHC molecule. Here's another example, the 2705 allele of HLA-B. In a person infected with flu, they found this peptide. If they sequence all the peptides, including their own peptides, host peptides that are, are found there, they find the only thing that's found is an arginine in position two always and an arginine or lysine in position nine. Nothing else matters. These are the anchor residues that deliver the affinity for that particular allele of HLA-B. The length is important to allow the N and C termini to bind and the rest of the amino acids don't matter in terms of MHC binding but they could uh, influence whether the T cell receptor would recognize them. For class two, remember the peptides are longer but there's also anchor residues that you can find uh, some examples shown here. So anchor residue is a, an identical or similar residue among sets of peptides that bind with high affinity. Now let's put it all together, looking at the T cell receptor contacting the MHC peptide surface. On the left is a, a, a three-dimensional structure showing here would be the antigen presenting cell or the infected cell, beta 2 microglobulin, alpha 1, 2, 3 chains of the MHC class 1 with a peptide in here. Here's the alpha beta T cell receptor. The colored loops represent the hypervariable regions. And what you can see if you're now looking down from the top towards the MHC molecule and they projected the position of the, the, the three hypervariable loops of the beta chain and the three hypervariable loops of the alpha chain, 
you can see that they contact the peptide, but they also contact the alpha helices of the MHC molecule. They're not just contacting the peptide. Uh, forget about these over here. That has to do with some details we won't cover. But in two dimensions, this comes back to a question we had last time. Are the V alpha and V beta chains actually interacting with class one uh, separately from the peptide? Well, there are regions of V alpha that are interacting with class one. There are regions of V beta that are interacting with class one. And it tends to be the CDR3 loops that make the most contact with the peptide and the one and two uh, loops that make more contact with MHC. But really, it's the entire surface here and its ability to interact with the entire surface of MHC peptide that determines whether or not the T cell will stick strongly there. So we call this, uh, this region of the MHC with a peptide facing up from the cell the composite surface, put together the surface of the MHC and the peptide that's bound. That is what is seen by the T cell receptor, not just the peptide, but the whole surface. Any questions about that? So again, in, in this diagram, if we think about the anchor residues, they're not shown here, but anchor residues would be ones in the peptide that are pointing sort of down towards the, the, the floor of the groove and maybe sideways towards amino acids in the, in the alpha helices. But other residues pointing up that are not conserved between all the peptides that MHC can bind, some of those um, are going to be in in a certain sequence that is detected by certain T cells that you have in your body. And it's not just those residues, but the entire surface of the MHC plus the parts of the peptide that are pointing upward that is seen by the T cell receptor. So really think about this, study it, understand how T cells and the T cell receptor recognize the antigen. It's not just the peptide, it's the whole thing. And this has a very important implication, which is known as MHC restriction. What that means is that a given T cell receptor, here's one shown here, recognizing MHC peptide, it's specific not only for the peptide, but for the unique combination of the peptide with that particular MHC molecule. So in this example, we've come back to this 201 allele of HLA-A. The T cell from this individual recognizes a peptide, let's say HIV reverse transcriptase bound to HLA-A, and the reason it can bind to 201 is because it has the right residues, anchor residues, that interact with the polymorphic residues in HLA-A-201. But the T cell, uh, the affinity is generated by both binding to the class one molecule and the peptide. So if uh, the T cell recognize, there might be another HLA molecule like B, 5201 that can bind the same peptide. Maybe the groove is similar enough that that's pe the same peptide can bind there. But the structure of the MHC class 1 molecule is different for B than B5201 than 80201. And now the total affinity isn't high enough. So this T cell cannot recognize this antigen presenting cell. Alternatively, if this if a different peptide is presented, even though you have HLA A201, if this isn't a good fit for that T cell, you will get no recognition. I know this is a difficult concept, but it's really important that you understand this for the next lectures on T cell selection in the thymus. This particular observation actually won the Nobel Prize for Zinker, Nagel, and Doherty in the 80s. What they found is that if you take a T cell from a mouse, can recognize viruses um, that's been generated that can kill virally infected cells from that mouse. If you infect cells from another mouse of a different haplotype, um, it cannot kill cells from that, that strain of mice that has a different MHC class 1 molecule. Even if the same peptide is presented, the T cell's ability to recognize antigen is restricted to particular MHC that's presenting that peptide. That's what it means. Yeah. It's the same for class one and class two, and it's CD4 and CD8. All T cell recognition of, of peptides is MHC restricted. It's restricted to the allele um, 
specific uh, alleles and specific members of the gene family. Now in a particular viral infection, there might be another viral peptide that's presented by, you know, uh, HLA-B and a different T cell in the body that can recognize this. So it's not, there's not o always one T cell and either an antigen is there or it's not. But for any one particular T cell it, that it forms a good fit with an MHC peptide, it's not going to form a good fit with the same peptide in different MHC or same MHC in different peptide. So now that we understand MHC restriction and we understand gene families and polymorphism, we can try to put this in perspective of why it's important for the immune system and why it's important for the species as well. So what this figure is trying to show in the gray circles is the universe of peptides that's produced uh, from, let's say, all the proteins in a virus. You're infected with influenza, it's got eight proteins. As the influenza is dividing, uh, is replicating, those proteins are produced and degraded. There might be 80 viral peptides, there might be 100, I don't know the number, but this circle is just all of the potential viral peptides that could bind to MHC class one and be presented to T cells. If you, uh, so if you're homozygous for haplotype one, if, you're, uh, if we did not have lots of alleles in the population and you only had HLA-A1, HLA-B1, HLA-C1, that could uh, give you the ability to bind to a certain fraction as shown in yellow here. If you had a different haplotype, it would be this, you know, a similar amount, maybe different peptides, but similar fraction of the total. But if you have two different haplotypes because you're heterozygous and you receive different uh, MHC genes from father and mother, now you can present twice as many peptides from this universe of all of the peptides available from that pathogen. If you have the two haplotypes have some overlap, so maybe you get the same HLA-B, but HLA-A and C are heterozygous, you don't present quite as many peptides as possible. Now this refers to, to um, the polymorphism, but you can imagine gene families also contribute to this. If you only had one MHC class one molecule, this yellow circle would be one third the size. Having three instead of one lets you cover a lot more, and having two alleles for each lets you cover even twice that. So if you had one gene for each and no polymorphism, you would have one sixth the amount of uh, yellow as you see here. And that is going to put you at a disadvantage. And we know that that's true from clinical studies. This shows you the percentage of HIV infected individuals who have not progressed to the AIDS disease. If, you're, if you look at the patients who, who go the longest from the time they seroconvert to the time they get sick, they are heterozygous for each MHC class one and each MHC class two allele. And most people are, but there's some unfortunate people who are homozygous, even for one MHC allele, you can see that they succumb to the disease more ra rapidly. And if it's more than one, it's even faster. So this isn't just an abstract picture. It has real consequences. And the buildup of many alleles of MHC molecules in the population uh, has consequences for the individual because you are heterozygous for each of these and that doubles the amount of peptides you can potentially present and increases the fraction of T cells that can join the attack. And at a species level, having polymorphism means that even in terrible epidemics where uh, terrible viruses that maybe have ways of evading the immune system um, or they don't produce, they have small genomes and there's not a lot of peptides, there's enough diversity in the population that a few individuals survive. So having a diverse population helps the individual by being heterozygous and helps the population by ensuring that some individuals can survive epidemics. And there's, again, evidence that this occurs because if there are certain geographical areas where particular alleles of MHC are very prevalent. So for example, 
malaria has been prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa for, for thousands of years. And there's a quite a bit less polymorphism for certain class one molecules in those regions because uh, there are certain class one uh, alleles that are protective or, or help you survive a malaria, malaria infection compared to others. So you can see that epidemics have shaped the, the specific alleles that are present in different parts of the world. And those that are protective, those people survive, pass along that gene. Those that are not, die off. But they might be helpful in another part of the world that is exposed to a different pathogen. Now, um, there's a figure in the text that's figure 533. It's really interesting, but it's not going to be covered on the test. But if you can't get enough of this MHC stuff uh, and genetics, you can have a look at that. But I, in, I have five more minutes and a couple more slides, but I know the last few minutes has been very complicated, so I'm willing to take a question now. I really advise you to take some time this weekend to look over the notes again and the slides, maybe read the sections of the book that talk about this, and try to grasp what I've been telling you today before you move forward in this course. Yeah. Now, all of them are expressed at the same time. So any cell that expresses class 1 will express all three genes and both alleles. There are some genes that are expressed monoallelically. Um, these are not. These are both alleles are expressed for class 1 and class 2 and all the different, all the three um, genes of the families. Yeah. Is the TCR uh, and MHC complex triggered via uh, clustering? Yes. You'll learn about clustering in a later lecture. Yeah, so there's, there's many tens of thousands probably of each MHC allele um, product on the surface. So it's thought that only, you only need a couple of them, though, to get a T cell activated. So even if most of the MHC is bound to self peptides, a few foreign peptide bearing MHCs can activate a T cell. Now, just a reminder hold on, in three minutes, you'll be able to come up and pick up your exam. They're in piles, 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. Um, but I want to hold off and just tell you a couple more things about MHC genetics. I said early on that the major histocompatibility complex refers to a group of genes that's found in the same locus on one chromosome. And that's shown here in figure 526. It's on chromosome 6 in the human. There's about 200 genes in this MHC locus. Only a few of them are shown here. And they're color coded so you can see that there's a region of the MHC where all the class 1 um, alpha chains are encoded, and then a region where all the class 2 alpha and beta chains are encoded, and that's called the class 2 region. Uh, so actually in all organisms that have been studied, the MHC molecules cluster together on a single chromosome. There's another region that's called class 3 region, and you don't have to worry there is no class 3 MHC molecule. Um, it's called class 3 because a lot of genes that are important for immune responses are found in the interval here between the class 2 region and class 1 region. Some complement genes, some cytokines, uh, but it's just a historical term for a region of interest to immunologists, but there are no uh, MHC presenting proteins that are encoded by genes here. And they're not usually polymorphic, these genes either. So I'm, I think I'm going to skip the figure 528, uh, which goes into some details of the class 2 region, but I do want to say one thing, which is that Interferons, which you learned about earlier in the class, have a, a tremendous influence on the expression of the MHC uh, 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 genes themselves at a transcriptional level. And it's thought that one re reason that the MHC molecules are, are found near each other is because interferons, uh, when you produce interferons, you want to coordinately regulate the expression of the genes involved in the immune response. And they use common transcriptional activators. So the class 1 genes, as well as beta 2 microglobulin, proteasome, TAP subunits, all of these, their, their transcription is increased when cells are exposed to interferon alpha, interferon beta, the type 1 interferons we learned about that are produced in response to viral infection. So we talked vaguely before about how type 1 interferons increase the ability of, a host of other cells to resist infection. One way is because they greatly increase expression of the class 1 molecules, as well as the, the proteasome um, subunits and the TAP transporters, so that they can, uh, that doesn't protect them, but that alert, helps alert other cells if that they are infected. 
Now, type 2 interferon or interferon gamma is particularly important for increasing expression of class 2. Um, it's made by NK cells. It's made by T cells in response to bacterial infection, uh, for example. And that will lead to increased expression of MHC class 2 molecules and all of the other proteins that are involved in MHC class 2 antigen presentation. So I know we're late, but I just want to show you one of these. ...of MHC class 1 molecules takes place in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. The initial folding of the class 1 heavy, or alpha, chain is aided by the chaperone calmexin. The partially folded chain is transferred to a second chaperone, calreticulin, which aids the further folding of the chain and the association of beta-2 microglobulin. Other proteins... So I, I know we're late, so I'm going to stop it there, but you can see how this is going to be useful to put things in motion. Uh, and there's another one for MHC class 2. If there's anything in these anim animations I did not cover in the notes, you don't have to worry about it. Okay. Next Monday, Professor Wall starts, but I'll be back next Friday for one more lecture.